So this isn't a watching the world burn video, <laughs> but but I did want to start making some videos in preparation for uh, a possible interview. Uh, it's kind of like Tucker Carlson uh, meeting with uh, Vladimir Putin, and uh, this is going to be me meeting with the equivalent. So I, I won't want I don't want to spoil the surprise, but in case it doesn't happen, so I don't I don't want you that. Uh, but I do, I think I did score an interview where we're going to talk about my book, The Internet is Infected. And I, and I thought about, I've been thinking about the interview, and it was like, well, what do you, what do I want to discuss in the interview? I mean, of course, it's going to be all about the book. But in order for you to appreciate the book or understand its, its relevance or my, um, my credentials, uh, so to speak, we have to go back in history, and, and I hate talking about myself, and I know the question that always arises in these interviews, tell us about yourself. And so I just thought I would make this video to tell you about myself and my credentials for writing this book, so that the interview that I have with this influential person will just be focused solely on the book, because I'm going to just tell them to, in their description, reference this video. So, just like Vladimir Putin and his uh, interview with Tucker Carlson, we have to go back to 300 years before Christ <laughs> and talk about my life, because this is all relevant. If you're going to trust what I've written in this book, and by the way, the person, uh, they have a website, uh, the PDF, I've made it, I'm going to make it freely available to the, the members of the organization. I don't want to give it away. And uh, so you, all you got to do is join this organization and you can go up and get a copy of the book for free because it was written in 2016 and truthfully only about 70-80% of the material in the book is still relevant in today's world. And I do want to bring it up to date and publish a three volume set. So let's, let's get to my background because this is my background video. Alright, you can cut it off if you're not interested in who the hell that cybersecurity guy is. And, and by the way... Uh, the question was raised, uh, where did that cybersecurity guy, if you go on the internet, you can't find me. Nobody, nowhere, I mean, I am buried in the algorithm, especially, it, 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 so if you search for that cybersecurity guy, you find the cybersecurity guy, you find cybersecurity guy, you find everybody but me. But it's that, just like John McCain talked to about Obama, that guy, I am that guy, I am that cybersecurity guy. And uh, so the question was going to come up, where can I be found? And I've already made a video about that. I mean, I am that cybersecurity guy everywhere. I'm on Getter. I'm on uh, X is that cybersec guy. You know, I'm, I'm, if, if you follow my videos, I'm that cybersecurity guy on Rumble. Uh, of course, I got my geopolitics channel, The Burn. But let's get into my background so that you can trust the book. And hopefully uh, this organization will link to this video. And that's why I'm making it. So I got to go all the way back to age 14. <laughs> and you're going, what is age four? What did you do at age 14 that's relevant to a cybersecurity book? Holy moly. Well, anyway, at that time, uh, marijuana was uh, still illegal. And uh, I was running a drug, uh, drug ring, if you want to call it that, because back then it was illegal. And I had my own uh, marijuana farm. And, uh, and so I was peddling uh, my drugs out. And of course, I read at that time, I was an avid reader and I read books on how you run. If you want to learn how the cartels work, uh, you've got the man in charge and he is insulated. And so what you do is you establish, uh, I had three people below me, three trusted individuals who didn't turn out to be trustworthy. And that's how I had to get out of the business. If they had been trustworthy, we would all have been rich. Instead, they, they wanted to, uh, beat their chest but you got to remember these are teenagers and uh, they were like oh we know the head dude man we know the guy in charge we're gonna tell ever tell our friends you know yeah and, and of course and it's, what happened I, I anyway i was peddling marijuana out uh throughout the high schools i was making pretty decent money you know the thing is if you're at the top you're not making the most money it's the people at the bottom that actually make the most money so i'm selling it let's say five dollars an ounce the, the next layer, uh, the three people, they're selling it for $20 an ounce. And then it goes down from there until it finally gets to the, the, the end user and they're getting it for $100 an ounce. Just telling you how drugs work, how the cartels work. Okay, hopefully you find this interesting. And, uh, and so I gained a lot of experience in how to manage a criminal cartel, which was very relevant. And what's ironic here, and the reason I'm telling you this story 
is because later on I had to, to admit to the NSA so that I could get my SBI uh, security clearance that I had run this drug uh, business. And, uh, and they, they told me, and it was obviously honest, uh, they said, we don't care about your past, we just want to know you can't be compromised. Uh, because I've always worried that somebody's going to try to discredit me, which the government will do now. I, at the, back then, I trusted the government. I don't trust the, <laughs> the FBI or the government anymore. I can tell you that. So I think that this, if, if this interview goes where I think it's going to go, I, then, then, you know, I want this out in the open that, yeah, okay, I ran a drug cartel, but by the way, marijuana is legal now, right? So I can tell you the story because everything's legal. I, and you say, well, it wasn't back then. You still need to go to jail. Well, maybe so. So then we come up to, you know, I, I went to James Madison University. I was, I, I worked with the, uh, the uh, Army ROTC. And uh, we would go out and train. I, I did a lot of stupid things. Like I, they challenged me one time to rappel in two bounds off of a cliff. I almost ended up in a cave and killed myself. I mean, there's been many, 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 many stories about me trying, uh, almost dying. Uh, and of course, you know, now with my broken neck, I got no feeling in my hands or feet. But uh, so anyway, I graduated from James Madison University with a bachelor's in, in computer science uh, a minor in physics. I wanted a major in physics, and it was the theory of relativity. By the way, I got that. It, it just, it, it, my brain couldn't figure it all out, and so I flunked the midterm, and I had to drop the class, and I couldn't take that. If that was the one class that I needed to get a, a bachelor's degree in physics. Uh, and then, of course, I had a minor in mathematics, and uh, that was with a lot of help. By the way, watch the movie uh, Real Genius, because <laughs> that was who I had helping me. It was a guy from MIT. Uh, he was a 15-year-old that went to MIT, and he ended up at James Madison, and uh, he, he was my mentor. All I had to do was buy him a six-pack of beer, and he would teach me all about uh, abstract algebra and all the stupid stuff I had to pass to get those degrees. Uh, but in the meantime, while I was in there, I was in the Marine Corps Reserve. Okay, so the Marine Corps Reserve, I mean, this, this could be a long video. Uh, I was a combat engineer, and uh, I was fascinated by explosives. So when I watched the World Trade Center come down, I kind of have an understanding that that looked to me like a controlled demolition of the Twin Towers. And, uh, and, but, you know, as a, as a combat engineer, unless I would be allowed to go in there and inspect everything, no way we could ever know for sure. And there's been a lot of speculation about that because I can't see how the jet fuel got into the center of the buildings and just brought it down in such a controlled fashion. Uh, if, you've, if you've ever experimented with explosives, you always got to have a tamped explosion uh, where the, the, the explosives are on the inside of the object. So, if, for example, if you're going to take down a tree, you're not going to just plant a box of, blocks of uh, C4 on the outside of the tree and try to blow it up because all the explosive power is going to go out away from the tree. No, you're going to drill a hole into that tree, stuff the TNT or the C4 or whatever into the tree, and then that should take it down. Of course, you could wrap a lot of deck cord around the tree. I'm just giving you examples. And so I, I, as I get into my background, I want to tell you a couple stories. I mean, the, the, my favorite story was when uh, Captain Kessler, I can call him now because uh, he's dead. And uh, he told me, he says, Kurt, I don't even, I don't know how I always got in charge of the troops. <laughs> I mean, what the hell? You know, because I am, I am like chaos. I mean, and he says, Kurt, man, take a team down. We had some Canadian observers. He said, take them down and blow something up so that, you know, they'll, they'll see what we're doing here. This was out in the Mojave Desert. We were doing live Soviet uh, military exercises, division level, you know, tanks firing down range, artillery firing, planes coming in, dropping bombs. People died. People died in these exercises. Uh, they, but these are the things you have to do to get ready for war. That's why in 1991, when... When uh, we went to war, we were so prepared because we had been training uh, for this that very war for, for many years. Uh, everybody knew what they were doing. We knew how to co coordinate everything. Everybody knew how to, you know, of course, back then, Prick, what is it, Prick 77, I had the radio on my back. But anyway, so I took the guys down, and uh, there, was a, there, there was nothing there to blow up. I mean, what are you going to do, stick it on the sand and just, you know, boom? You know, it's, it's like watching a big firecracker go off, and so... But luckily, there was a tank turret that was laying on the ground. <laughs> I told the guys, I said, 
oh hell yeah i said bring it all and they were like what do you what, what do you what do you want i said we are gonna blow the living hell out of this tank turret by the way tank turret have you ever seen it i mean it's 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 humongous it's a hell of a lot of metal and i could tamp the explosion because the lid was still intact and uh so so we had deck cord we had c4 we had tnt we stuffed it all into that tank turret it was amazing and uh and by the way you're supposed to get back about i think it's 500 meters you know when it's 140 degrees <laughs> you and, and all you've done is watch explosives blow up on the ground you're not going to go back the, the safe distance i mean all those regulations are written for for fools but in this particular instance uh, they actually made sense so we got back now you got to remember i had a, a an entire squad i mean everybody was carrying you know all got, the only thing we didn't have was bangalores uh, and so the, the, the explosion would have been even more massive with the Bangalores. But we had TNT, C4, and deck cord. We stuffed it all in that tank turret. And then I had a couple of football players. They flipped that lid over. And uh, so then we got back. It was about 100 meters away. Fire in the hole! Fire in the hole! Woohoo! And I mean, it was a massive explosion, <laughs> especially when you're only 100 meters away. And of course, the Canadian observers and the captain, they're up there like, holy shit, <laughs> what the hell was that? And uh, so, you know, but what happened was I didn't think about the consequences. I mean, those chunks of metal about the size of my hand or bigger, maybe the size of the boo dog here, right? I, I got to exploit him. And they went up into the atmosphere, I mean, into huge uh, uh, elevations. And uh, now, if you ever want to watch uh, uh, bombs coming in on you or anything, when, when you're looking at something and it's not moving, you know, it's not going over this way and it's not going over that way and all you see is a dot and it's, it's not moving, it's just coming straight. Well, anyway, chunks of metal <laughs> started started raining down on the entire company. I mean, it was, but I mean, really all you had to do because it was a nice clear day was just stand there and you could just move to the side and boom, a chunk of metal would hit here and boom, a chunk of metal would hit there. And uh, and so anyway, I luckily nobody got killed. And of course, a lot of the guys, they, they incoming! And of course, they're diving for cover and they're heading to the bushes and everything else. It was, uh, it was quite the event. Well, then, you know, of course, and then the captain's cussing away. Fucking engineers, these stupid bastards. He says, and of course, I'm the guy in charge. <laughs> I had to agree with him. I was like, well, maybe that wasn't a good idea. But what was really funny was when we got back to the deuce and halves is that uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, deuce and half operators, they were underneath the vehicles. And they hadn't come out. I mean, it had been probably about 10 minutes since the explosion happened. And, and, and finally, they peeked their heads up. Because you know what, Motor T, I'm going to tell you, those guys, I don't want to call them cowards, but they're just not into, like, picking up a gun and charging the enemy. Let's just put it that way. That's why they're in Motor T, you know. It's kind of like the guys like me that work on the airplanes. You know, we don't fly them. You know, uh, luckily, the officers in, in the military fly the airplanes. And, and that I like it that way. But anyway, so... We got back, and the, and the guys were like, well, what what the hell was, what, what happened? And so what had happened was the, the tank turret lid had landed in front of the vehicles. And uh, can you imagine, I mean, a couple thousand pounds of metal landing within, you know, let's just say 100 meters or less of the vehicles. I mean, the, the ground actually shook like an earthquake. And so, it, and then they said it just, it, the, the dust and the, the sand that flew up and then it just spun. I mean, this was, the vehicles were back a thousand meters. I blew that tank turret lid a thousand meters through the air. And so these guys, you know, they said, well, it was, it, it was something, you know, it was huge and it spun off into the desert and we just want to make sure that you're done blowing stuff up. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah we're, we're done. And the captain, of course, he's looking over at me. I mean, I, he had fire in his eyes. <laughs> if he could have court-martialed me right there and sent me to Leavenworth, I'm sure he would have. So we're going to get into story after story like this. I'll start posting these because i got to give you my background so that you understand my motivation for writing the book, The Internet is Infected. The Ultimate Cybersecurity Guide for Small Business and Home Computing by Kirk A. Ellis. So this is the first video of many that will be coming out. 
I can only make these. I'll be posting this on X, of course. I'll be it'll be on the burn on uh, Rumble, and then of course that cybersecurity guy at YouTube. Peace out. Stay free. Love the boo dog. If you wish to follow me other places, I post on many topics. My main interest is geopolitics. To follow me for geopolitics, I am that cybersecurity guy on YouTube. Under the playlist, watching the world burn. On Rumble. My channel is simply The Burn. I also post all my videos on X. That handle is That Cybersec Guy. That Cyber SEC Guy. I'm also on Getter and True Social. On Getter, it's the same as X. That Cybersec Guy. And on True Social, it is That Cybersecurity Guy. I also do minimal postings on Telegram at The World Burning. The World Burning on Telegram. I'm limited to two gigabytes there, so I don't post often unless it's a short video. I also do videos on outdoor activity because I'm into of hiking mainly. But it's Outdoors with Kirk on Rumble. That is my main channel for outdoor activity. But I also have a playlist on YouTube called Hiking, Biking, and Camping in the United States. Lastly, I do reviews and tutorials and commentary on various products. On Rumble, it is just simply that cybersecurity guy. That's my catch-all for any video that doesn't fit in geopolitics or outdoors. On YouTube, it is reviews, tutorials, and commentary on products. Hope you can follow me other places. Peace out. Stay free.